Hi guys, Mr. Martin here again. Thanks so, so much for joining me now. Very exciting one for you today. What we're going to be speaking about is the evolutionary approach to psychology. Now, being an evolutionary biologist myself, this is the area of psychology that really, really excites me. So again, we're not really going to be talking about the applications of this approach. We'll save that for a future time. But what we will be speaking about is the absolute basics of this approach and ultimately what it's got to tell us about the world of psychology. So let's begin. So an evolutionary psychologist would attempt to explain our mental or psychological behaviours, such as memory or perception or language, whatever else it might be, as an adaptation. That is, the products of evolution by natural selection. So what do we mean by that? Well, this dude here, this is Charles Darwin. And back in the 1850s, Charles writes a book called On the Origin of Species. And in it, he argues that all physical traits in animals and plants can be accounted for by natural selection. What he means is that all physical characteristics of plants and animals must have a survival value. They must make you more fit for your environment. Otherwise, if they don't, then natural selection very quickly gets rid of it. Let's take a practical example. Let's think of a polar bear's fur. Why is it so thick? Why is it white? Why is it so fluffy? Well, it's white so it can creep up on unsuspecting seals and it's thick and it's fluffy to keep the heat in. So polar bear's fur is an adaptation because it helps the polar bear to survive. A little bit later on, Charles Darwin writes a second book. This one he calls The Descent of Man. And he changes his argument ever so slightly. What he argues in this book is that, yeah, physical traits can be accounted for by natural selection. But what if, what if psychological traits are also handed down the same way? So to Charles Darwin and now to all evolutionary psychologists, all human behaviour must have a survival value. That behaviour must have evolved to make you more fit for your environment. If it doesn't make you more fit for your environment, then natural selection gets rid of it. So the evolutionary approach would argue that much of human behaviour is the output of psychological adaptation evolved to solve problems here. This is our ancestral environment. It's roughly a quarter of a million years ago, and we're in the plains of Africa. The evolutionary approach refers to this as the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, or the EEA for short. Well, let's look at some of the problems that primitive man might have had to solve. There are predators all around. There is limited food. There's unclean water. There's the constant threat of predators, the constant threat of other tribes coming in and wanting to kill you. There's a multitude of different problems to solve. So evolutionary psychologists would argue that all human behaviour arose to solve these problems. Now, one of the things about this is that society, of course, no longer looks like that. Society now looks a little bit more like this. But evolution takes a long time to catch up. So even though our world now looks like this, we still have the psychology that evolved to solve the problems here. So let's think of a few practical examples. Why do we have friendships? What's the benefit of keeping humans close to you? Well, back in the EEA, we might say that humans are more likely to stick together because there's strength in numbers. More humans in a group means that predators would be less likely to attack. That is where the behavior evolved and you can see it still applies even to this day, just in a slightly different environment. Well, slightly, incredibly different environment, but you get the picture. Now, obviously, an evolutionary psychologist can't build a time machine to go back into the past and check if his theories are correct. So what they might do instead is something called cross-cultural research. They'll fly halfway across the world and they'll visit the next best thing. They'll visit hunter gatherer societies. These guys are the aborigines of the bush in Australia. These guys will lead a life very similar to our primitive humans from a quarter million years ago. 
So the evolutionary psychologist might watch these guys, record what they're doing, observe their behavior, and then infer what primitive humans might have done 250,000 years ago. Other evolutionary psychologists might not bother. They might actually attempt to get into the past. And how do they do that? Well, they dig it up. So some evolutionary psychologists might look for primitive human settlements. They might look for uh, tools, artwork. They might look for uh, eating implements. They might look for a thousand and one different things and try and figure out what primitive man is trying to solve, what their behavior would have been like back then. Alternatively, you might like to dig up primitive humans themselves, their skeletons, have a look at the size of their craniums, their brains, have a look at what kind of debris is around them and try and figure out who they were, what their life was like and what their behaviour was like as well. Let's use stress as an example because this is a really interesting and really kind of accessible one to think about. Stress makes sense a quarter million years ago. Think about what's happening here. A big scary predator, a bear or a saber-toothed tiger has jumped out and has scared you. So automatically stress kicks in. Adrenaline starts running through your veins, pumping up your muscles, making your heart beat faster and getting you ready to either run away or to fight for your life. Of course, as soon as you do manage to get away from the bear, the whole body calms down. This is what primitive man would have deemed stressful back in the EEA. Of course nowadays not so many bears going around can rust. Now what we have is stress that looks a bit like this. Now instead of big angry bears jumping out at us, now we get stressed at things like our workload, bills to pay, exams coming up, driving tests and of course these things don't go away quickly. They stick around. They're chronic problems. The workload goes up and up and up. Of course, we're still reacting the same way. We still react in the same way that we evolved a quarter million years ago in exactly the same way nowadays. Adrenaline pumping through your veins, making you feel anxious, your heart's beating faster. But of course, it doesn't make sense now, but it did to the primitive man in the EEA. In terms of strengths and weaknesses here, one of the best strengths about the evolutionary approach is that it is scientific. What we've got here is a lot of observation, a lot of recording of data, coming to general, uh, reliable and beneficial conclusions about evolutionary biology. That also, psychology should you say, that also leads us into the second point, which is it combines easily with a biological approach. An evolutionary psychologist might think about the survival value of behaviour, and the biological approach might attempt to look for the genetics that underlie that behaviour. So the two of them combine together very, very nicely to give twice the power. Finally, this allows for a scientific study of very, very complex behaviours. Things the other approaches wouldn't dare touch. They couldn't even scratch the, th the surface. Things like religion, things like culture, things like sociality, things like friendship, all these different things that the other approaches couldn't even dare to explain. The evolutionary approach is very comfortable in thinking about possible benefits and how these things arose. Weaknesses, there are a lot of them. Uh, the first big one is that there's a lack of empirical research. What does this mean? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of research and we have a lot of what uh, hunter-gatherer societies of nowadays tell us about humans. But really what we're doing is projecting that millions of years, quite literally millions of years, into the past. Is that correct? Does that tell us anything at all about primitive man or their evolution? Probably not. Secondly, this suffers hugely from determinism. determinism sorry. There is no free will here. The evolutionary approach says that if you have the gene for aggression or if you've evolved to be stressed in some way, then that's always going to happen. That's always going to be the behaviour that you show. Do you not have a choice in that? Do you not have any kind of free will behind this? Remember, psychology frowns upon determinism. Thirdly, this suffers very much from ethnocentrism. This means that what we find about evolutionary psychology actually depends on the psychologist who's doing the research. So for example, if we're looking into the evolution of family behavior, if it's a UK scientist that's doing it, they might look at things like in, the, in terms of mother and father, about siblings, about finding a stable place to be. 
Whereas if it's a scientist from, let's say, Japan or China, they have completely different views on what makes a stable family over there. So they might come to completely different conclusions based on the same evidence. That's ethnocentrism. And finally, this is guilty of maybe being something called a just so story. Just to let you know, a just so story, uh, these were written by Rudyard Kipling a long time ago, uh, stories for children that explained how animals got their peculiar uh, traits. So the most famous one is how the leopard got his spots. Why are leopards spotty? Well, it's because an Ethiopian man painted all these little black spots on them to make them more attractive, to make them more attractive, sorry, and to make them look like pebbles on the ground. Just so. At the time, of course, we didn't know how a leopard got his spots, so that could have been right. We don't know. Evolutionary psychology is guilty of the same thing. Are we not guilty of conducting these huge just-so stories? People keep friends because, yeah, there was strength in numbers 250,000 years ago. Or is it because that the tribe gives you some kind of uh, social bond? Or might it be that it's more easy to find food if there's more of you? Or might it be that it's more easy to start fires if there's more people around to collect firewood for you? There's multiple different explanations for the same behaviour. Just so. And we can't get around that. So in conclusion then, guys, the evolutionary approach is very, very useful. It's scientific. It gives us a really nice study of very, very complex behaviours. But because of a lack of research, because it's ethnocentric, and because it might just be one huge, big, just so story, we have to take it again with a little pinch of salt. So that's a lot, guys. That is a very, very brief introduction to the evolutionary approach. Hope it was helpful for you. Um, that is probably the last video on approaches that we're going to do for a wee while. I want to start looking at the actual course content now. Uh, but let me know if you want me to look at the other three approaches and we'll put a video out for you there. So thanks a lot, guys. Look forward to seeing you in our next video. Uh, and until then, take it easy and we'll see you later. Cheers.